I'm still trying to process what just happened in this game, but let's get into it. I was playing Shardul Gagar from India, and coming into this game, I actually had a lot of time to prepare because yesterday was a rest day. But instead of like pouring over opening theory yesterday, I did a lot of non-chess things. Uh, I went bowling. I played some ping pong. Had some Thai food. And I only started preparing for my opponent this morning. I really just took the day off yesterday from chess. And this morning, I looked at my opponent's games and saw that he's capable of playing e4 and d4 and c4 and f3. So I really didn't know what to expect coming into this game. But I found out soon enough what opening he would go for. And once the game began, uh, he played pawn to d4. And we went into a queen's gambit declined. And in this position, I saw that he's been playing a lot of Catalan with g3, so this is what I was uh, more expecting. But he went for knight c3, which of course is also very playable. And in this position, I've played a lot of different moves. Uh, I've played c6, I've played bishop e7, I've taken on c4, uh, there's what goes in, I've played a6 recently. But the line I went for is knight b d7. Uh, this is called the Barman variation, and it's one of my pet lines. And it leads to just a lot of different types of uh, structures, depending what white plays. So it's really a way to try and get a fresh position from early on. So here my opponent took on d5. I take back, and he plays bishop to g5. Uh, this is one of the more standard ways of playing. Uh, black is, in some cases, threatening to take on d5. So I play c6, solidifying the center. He plays e3, and I go for h6. And I am still in preparation here, and after bishop h4, I played the move pawn to g5. And this is not a typical occurrence in these queen's gambit decline structures where black goes for the quick h6 g5, but this is a, a variation I discovered about a year ago, and the more I looked into it, the more excited I became about it, because it's just a way to imbalance a position early, and the idea is after bishop g3, I very quickly play knight h5, and black is guaranteed to get the bishop pair here. So I was happy to basically play this over the board for the first time. Now my opponent here played queen to c2. I took on g3, he takes, and I played bishop to g7. And here there's a few different options for white. I think the main move is bishop to d3, and then white can stay flexible and choose whether to castle kingside or queenside. But here my opponent chose to castle queenside right away, and from here, I still kind of knew the, the basic plan for black is generally when white castles queenside and leaves a rook on h1, then black definitely doesn't want to castle kingside. And my plan here is to eventually castle queenside. And I basically knew the ideal setup is knight b6, bishop e6, queen e7, and castle long. So I started with knight b6. And I was expecting my opponent to play bishop d3, which is definitely the most natural developing move. But my opponent thought for almost 10 minutes here before playing a very explosive move, pawn to e4. Uh, a small correction, it was way more than 10 minutes, uh, almost 15 to 20 minutes to play pawn e4. And this definitely surprised me. And um, I was definitely not specifically prepared for this variation. Uh, and generally, e4 is not a great break for white because black has a bishop pair. And in general, when one side has a bishop pair and there's some pawn trades, then the two bishops become very happy. Uh, but the reason why my opponent went for e4 is my king is still in the center. So there's some pros and cons for playing this break. On one hand, it does favor the bishops. But on the other hand, it's trying to exploit my king, which is still uh, kind of far away from getting safe on the queen side. And yeah, in this position, I took my first extended think of the game. And I was mainly deciding between taking on e4 and playing bishop e6. 
And I was close to playing bishop e6, but I didn't want to allow white to play e5 and just get a nice looking space advantage, a more closed position where my bishops aren't so impressive and the knights are probably preferable. So after my think, I did decide to take on e4. And after knight takes e4, I played the move queen to d5. And uh, yeah, this looks like a somewhat of a risky move because yeah, my queen is out in the open, but I was trying to target the a2 pawn. And I should note here that I wanted to play bishop e6, which is maybe a more natural uh, developing move, but I didn't like the prospect of knight to c5. I thought if white gets this move in, then my bishop and my pawn are attacked, rook e1 is coming, and yeah, I didn't see a great way to make this line work for black. So I play queen d5, and now the idea is if white plays a move like rook e1, setting up some discoveries, then I can play bishop e6. And I don't think white has time for knight c5, because then I can snag the a pawn. And yeah, there should be a lot of nice active play for black in that position. The queen would still defend the bishop from a distance. So instead of rook e1, my opponent played knight c3. And I want to note that my opponent was spending a lot of time, like took a lot of time to play e4, and took about 25 minutes to play this move knight c3. Um, but this is a move I was expecting, because it's very natural to attack the queen, defend the pawn, and get ready to play rook e1 check. So I get out the way, I play queen a5, and he plays rook to e1. I play bishop to e6. And in this position, I was feeling good. I thought that if I get one more move in, the castling queen side, then I'll just have a, an amazing setup with the two bishops, um, especially this bishop aimed at white's isolated queen's pawn, and just really harmonious uh, pieces all around. So I, I thought that things are looking pretty good for me, not only based on the position, but also time situation. I'm up about uh, 35 minutes on the clock. But my opponent here played uh, a move which I think is called for, and it's by far the most aggressive move in the position, is rook takes e6. And in this moment, I do want to apologize for what I did in the last video. I think I, I scared a lot of people with Levy's uh, sacrifice a rook clip uh, interspersed in, in my commentary. A lot of people were complaining in the comments, so I'm not going to do that in this video. But anyway, my opponent did sacrifice the rook, and the idea is after pawn takes, there's queen g6, and um, yeah, I'm definitely on the back foot because white is attacking the bishop and the king and the pawn. I had to play king f8 to defend and um, yeah, here my opponent took a, a long time to take the pawn on e6. And note now that my opponent's used almost all his time to, to get to this position, has just over six minutes left, and I have an hour to try and figure out what's going on. Now, I do have the material advantage. I am up a rook for knight and pawn, but the position is far from simple and I had to figure out what to do. Now, I want to pause here before we go forward with the game, because there's something super, super surprising that I'm, I'm still trying to process, and it's what my opponent told me after the game, which I still have a hard time believing, but um, I, I do believe my opponent. It's just, it's, it's super crazy that uh, this could be true. But my opponent told me after the game that he's seen this exact position before. Like this is some part of his opening preparation that maybe he looked at a while ago and he spent all his time trying to remember what, what's happening after the exchange sack, mainly what's happening after queen takes e6. And I was shocked that he took all his time to, to get to a position that he knew. But um, yeah, sometimes this is what happens in chess when you study so many different opening lines before a game, or probably in my opponent's case, he did not review this line before the game. Now, 
of course, I had no clue about this during the game. I had no clue my opponent had seen this position before, maybe had some idea what the engine evaluation could be. And in this position, I was trying to play for a win. I really wanted to pressure my opponent on the clock. And even though my king is quite exposed, I, I thought I have enough resources to defend here. Now, the move I played was rook to e8, attacking the queen. I thought this was the most natural move. He plays queen g6, and I play rook to e7, just a more useful square for the rook, over defending the bishop, maybe giving my king some path to run away in the future. And here, my opponent plays bishop to d3. And in this position, uh, my opponent is below two minutes, but... I took a very long think here, trying to figure out what to do next. And I realized that black doesn't really have too many candidate moves. It's actually very difficult to find a reasonable move here for black. Now, there's a, a tricky move, h5, that briefly crossed my mind. Um, but I pretty quickly dismissed this move, even though it has the idea of queen takes g5, bishop h6 wins the queen. Uh, but there's this move, knight takes g5. And I was fantasizing about sacking my queen and then winning it back. But in the resulting position, yeah, white has three pawns and a bishop for a rook. So this is not good at all for black. So going back, h5 was out of the question. I was mainly considering knight d7 and knight d5, because uh, really no other piece has a great move here. And I really wanted to play knight d7, but... The drawback of this move is it allows bishop c4, given the knight is no longer controlling the c4 square. And this bishop is just piercing through the position. And I thought, uh, yeah, white has ideas of like taking, and if takes, there's takes and takes and checkmates. And there's also ideas of rook e1 to remove my rook and getting queen f7 checkmate. And meanwhile, my queen is pretty much sidelined, and white has ideas of also bring the knight in. So I thought knight d7 is way too risky, and after a long think, I opted for the move knight to d5 uh, after thinking for about half an hour. And the benefit of this move is it's a bit more centralizing. I'm pressuring the knight on c3, uh, but the drawback of this move is it allows this move queen f5 check because my knight is obstructing my queen from controlling f5. Another drawback with knight d5 is it gives up control over the c8 square. So after I play king e8, my opponent plays queen c8. And we go from what's like a really complicated and messy looking position to ending the game in threefold repetition. And the game ended here, basically. Um, yeah, king e8 position has occurred three times and after just 26 moves the game ended in a draw and i really wanted to push for a win especially given the time situation but i just didn't see an opportunity to do so and i'm really really curious to see if stockfish had any improvements for me actually before i run the engine analysis i want to just make a note because my opponent told me after the game that he was considering declining the threefold. Uh, he was considering playing the move bishop to b5, which did not even cross my mind during the game. But uh, I think this would have been like a cold shower, maybe, if, if he played this move. Uh, it's just such a ridiculous looking move, putting the bishop where it can just be taken by the pawn. But of course, the point is if I take the bishop, his knight comes in and yeah, this looks actually really good for white. And if I play a move uh, like knight takes c3, I lose my queen because there's tactics along the fifth rank. And there's also some crazy lines. Like if I play king d8, then he can take and then take and then take and then here and then here and then here and then here. He's winning the rook. So also if king c8, there's uh, there's bishop d7 winning the queen. So we were talking about all these lines after the game, and we didn't actually reach a conclusion what black should do 
if white plays bishop b5. So I think now is the time to check with the engine. And yeah, as usual, I will click the button. As we wait for the engine to crunch, a uh, friendly reminder, I do have a merch promotion going on. Use coupon code Qatar to save 15% off all merch at shop.ironrosen.com. Here we go. Okay. Let's see the graph. Wow. So my opponent played the perfect game. I made one inaccuracy. Wow. So another like very clean game. But my opponent was like much better at some point. So let's see. It looks like this was a critical moment. So I was supposed to play bishop e6 according to the engine. Although I guess there's a lot of like playable options here. Like d takes e4. Definitely a playable move. And let's see. Let's see what Stockfish says. So queen a5 apparently gives white some edge. But sometimes you can't always trust the engine at a low depth. If we go forward... Is it actually better for white? We played into the most critical line. So my opponent was supposed to play queen d6 check, which was actually what I was expecting. I was going to play rook e7 here. Um, and somehow white is maybe slightly for choice. But after queen g6... Yeah, so if, if anyone wants to play for a win, it's white. I guess 95 is the way to do it. So real quick, what's happening after bishop b5? Knight b4. Ah, my opponent actually mentioned this move after the game. Knight b4 is insane. Because I pin the bishop, and if takes, it looks like white's winning the queen, but I take back and defend my queen. Wow. Like, B4 is the only move to, to like not be worse. Okay, so Bishop B5 wasn't a great option for white. But Knight E5, I was, after Knight E5, what was I going to do? I was just going to take it. And then I can't take on C3. Yeah, this would have been scary. Of course, it would have been risky for my opponent to play on with the time situation. Wow. So yeah, this was a, a pretty short game, but uh, yeah, still crazy. Like some of these variations are are hard to digest. So I think a draw is a, a fair result. I, I really was never better this game. Uh, if anything. Like, my position was very, very precarious. So, okay, happy to, to walk away with, with a draw. Um, hope people enjoyed this one. I'm still shocked that my opponent uh, <laughs> had seen this position before after king f8. Um, basically, like how many moves of prep? Like, 18 moves of prep from my opponent. I assume he's seen queen takes e6 before, too. But... Um, yeah, anyway, uh, thanks everyone for watching. If you have questions or comments about this game, leave them below. And stay tuned for three more rounds of chess. Uh, be sure to check out the Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Rosen. Jonathan Trance is doing commentary of all the rounds. And also stay tuned for more recaps, and I'll see you guys soon.